I mean, this is Shaitan's heyday. He's never had more tools than he has today. It used to be ghiba, you needed another person with you. Now all you have to have is a cell phone or the internet. First of all, uh, marhaban, welcome everybody. They say here marhaba with a soft H. So that's the way they say marhaban. They're soft people. The, uh, f first of all, it's an incredible blessing to be here uh, in Turkey. It's a difficult time for the Muslims. As you know, we have right next door on the border, I think it's several hundred mile long border, is Syria, which is a place very beloved to the Prophet Barakallah fi shamina wa yamanina. And he said it three times وسلم, And he also made dua against anyone that wished ill of the people of Sham or did anything to upset the people of Sham. And Sham, although in Syria they limit it to Damascus, uh, Sham really means Lebanon, Syria, Palestine. It's the whole area that's considered blessed. But uh, they're going through a very tr uh, trying time. Many of them are on the border now, refugees, the Turkish. In fact, they're not calling them refugees, they're calling them guests, uh, as a way of honoring uh, their status. Um, so you know, that's troubling always because we're in such blessing and everything's comfortable and we have so many uh, blessings. So it's important to remember that this is the nature of dunya. What's different about our time than other times is that we have television, we have 24-hour news cycle, we, we're exposed to all these things, but the Muslims throughout their history, if you look at their history, there, when there were some of the most flourishing times in one place were the worst times in other places. This is a human condition. Uh, what's happened now is it's globalized. Uh, Imam al-Nawawi was living during a very difficult time for Central Asians. Imam al-Ghazali was writing his great works during the occupation of, of uh, Palestine. I mean, people forget that the Crusaders were in the Muslim lands while Imam al-Ghazali was really flourishing as an intellectual, as a spiritual genius and all of the other things that he contributed. So it's important for us to keep that uh, in mind because some people, these events literally drive them into a type of madness. They lose their stability, they lose their balance. Um, because they are very trying uh, for people and certainly for the people in them. The best thing that we can do obviously is be advocates uh, and make dua especially. Dua is a dua silahul mu'min. Prophet Sallallahu said the dua is the silahul mu'min. It's the weapon of the believer. I mean this uh, hadith that we, the, you know, the Usuri scholars say asur al-karam al-haqiqah. That the foundation of speech is literal that you should take things literal before you move to any figurative interpretation. So if the Prophet said, a dua silahul mu'min, that's exactly what he meant. The dua is the weapon of the believer. Not the sword, not the spear, not the tank, not the, those are material weapons. But the real weapon of the believer, a silah, the real silahul mu'min. Is, is his connection or her connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have that connection, the Prophet sallallahu dua was also uh, Give us the yaqeen that makes all of the tribulations of this world insignificant. If you have yaqeen in your heart, if you have certainty, then the calamities of this world are exactly what they are. They're calamities of this world. And anything that happens in this world is hayyan in, 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 in relation to what happens in the next world. Here, our fitan are always limited. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the akhirah, it's not like that. And Ibn Abbas said, in every tribulation are three blessings. It could have been worse. 
You lost one hand, you could have lost both hands. You lost one eye, you could have lost both eyes. You broke your back, you could have uh, lost your life, right? It always could be worse. And then that it's in the dunya, right? It's in the, as long as it's in this world, it's easy in relation to the next world. And then it's in uh, worldly matters and not in religious matters. Because the real tribulation is when your deen is tried. People that lose their faith. People that, that's the real tribulation. As long as you have faith, everything is easy. So, you know, think about our brothers and sisters next door. Make dua for them. Um, alhamdulillah, you can see right beside them a country that's flourishing. It's good for those of you who haven't been to this country before. Uh, one of the real surprises is to see a functioning Muslim country. I mean, it's really nice to see Muslims functioning. This is a cleaner city than the European capitals. It's a cleaner city than our cities in America who are people coming from America. The people had a lot of civil society. We'll exclude the tra tra traffic driving because <laughs> they would have to have something of Islam, of the Muslim, modern Muslims, <laughs> or they wouldn't be Muslim, right? <laughs> but other than that, really, it's a civil society, beautiful people, and, uh, and they've really welcomed us. And so make dua for them, also for the president, you know, for the leaders of the country. Wallahi, the... the Abu Hanifa anhu, he, he said that if you, ha, you know, many of the scholars said this, but they said that the dua, that if you have a dua mustajab, you should do it for the leaders of the Muslims. You know, do it for the leaders. One of the, you know, I wanted somebody to do this. Nobody ever did it for me. I asked some people to do it. But in the haram, I wanted to do a decibel count on the duas. Because, you know, everybody says, ameen. And they're higher on certain things and lower on other things. Right? So like when they say, oh Allah, save us from the fire, you every go, oh, me. it goes way, way up. Then when it says, Allahumma aslih wulata umurina, you know, it all goes way down when they ask for them to, you know, to bless their rulers and, you know, but if they really, this is a sign that we don't have uh, common sense anymore. Because with their rectification is the rectification of the ummah. You know, the, the, the ulama say that it's the ahmaq who makes a dua against rulers. It's the fool, because the, the ruler's tawfiq is your tawfiq. If he has tawfiq, then the community has tawfiq. If he doesn't have tawfiq, everybody suffers from that. So it's important, you know, that we ask Allah to bless the, the wulat al-umur in Turkey, give them tawfiq. They're in a difficult time. There's a lot of enemies, there's a lot of people that don't want to see them succeeding like they are. You're in, in the European countries are in financial crisis. They have here, last year they had 10% uh, growth. This year it's close to 8%. The, the, you know, they're close to China in their growth. So it's, they're really thriving economically and we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless them uh, and, and strengthen them because their strength is the strength of the ummah. Inshallah, this is an interregnum period, you know, people forget history. If you know history, you can have long periods where, uh, that are called interregnum periods. This is one of those periods for the Muslims. So, but Morocco went almost a hundred years without uh, leadership during a civil war period. So these things happen in time. We, we obsess about our little time that we spend here. We're not here very long. The historical story is much greater than, than uh, than our individual stories, which doesn't mean that our own individual stories are not significant. They are, they're very significant. And the greatest story is the story of our Prophet Sallallahu and that was a historical time. Um, you, when you go, inshallah, we'll go see the panorama. SubhanAllah, <laughs> amazing. You know, if you listen, the dead speak. Because um, everything 
that they did is here. The traces of it are all here. And they did great things, these people. So. I feel ashamed to speak in here, you know. Mm. Alhamdulillah. The, um, Alhamdulillah, the, one of the things about this country that's a great blessing for us is that uh, normative Islam, what academically could be called normative Islam, uh, an Islam that uh, that transcends time and place. It's, it's not particularized. It's, it's the thing that is handed down. You know, when we read, you can take a, a book from written 200 years ago today in, 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 in the United States. You can take, for instance, uh, Walden Pond by Thoreau, and you can read it, and the amazing thing is that you can read it, despite the fact that between you and the original writer are a few hundred years that the greatest tradition that we have is, is language, that it's handed down. Um, that that, uh, that if, I, if I say to you, uh, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, I mean, even though that was written you know, several hundred years ago, you understand the meaning of those words uh, because language is transmitted, but also what's transmitted is meaning, right? Language is meaning, but the, the, the the traditions of people are handed down. That's what the word tradition in Arabic, naqal, uh, or torath is what's inherited. But naqal, it's called naqal in Arabic. It's yanquluhu. It's what's transmitted from one to another. And this is called tradition in English. It's the handing over of something because we're only caretakers for a short time. We have a, a time to take care of amanat. You know, they're called amanat. Uh, you know, adul amanati ila ahliha, that you should give the trust to the people of the trust. And each generation, there has to be people of trust that, you, that the previous generation that's leaving the world hands over to the generation now that is taking over the world. And this is the nature of, of, of life on earth. So the, our religion also has a tradition. Now the tradition has many components to it. But at the root of it are, uh, are tools that have to be learned because it's those tools that enable you to really understand the tradition. And, and our community developed very extensive tools. Now to give you an example of one of the most important ones and one of the few that is truly protected uh, in an amazing way is Tajweed. Tajweed is part of our tradition because the Sahaba, if you ask the Sahaba what Idram was, they wouldn't know what Idram was or Idram Bila Ghunna. They wouldn't know what a Med Far'i was or a Med Asli. They wouldn't know these things. If you gave them these technical terms, they wouldn't know them. But what they did know was how to recite the Quran. And one of the miracles of our religion and the miracles of our tradition is Tajweed. Because if you study any language, you will know that there are many ways to pronounce things in languages, and they will debate about how things were pronounced at any given time and place. If you want to study, I studied New Testament Greek in college and high school, but, in, but my Greek teacher said, we don't know how this was pronounced. We think it was pronounced like this. I had a Latin teacher that was of the opinion that the V was pronounced as a W, but there's other Latin teachers that claim it was pronounced as a V. And maybe there were more than one dialect. Some said Veni Veni Vidi, and the others said Veni Veni Vici, like that, right? So the, these differences are all over human language, but Tajweed is unique. There, if you go to Malaysia, they pronounce the Quran the same way. If you take Shia, they pronounce it the same as the Sunnis. If you take Ismailiyah, right, or a Zaydiya, any sect in Islam, they would do the same Tajweed. There's no difference in Tajweed. There's 17 points of articulation. There's five basic makharij. There's the sifat of the huruf are the same. They don't debate. There's a few very minor debates about jim and things like this, but they're, they're, they're negligible. How is that possible that the book is pronounced exactly the same way in the entire Muslim Ummah? There's no khilaf 
about how the Quran is recited. And even the, um, the harakat, you know, the masters of tajweed, they know exactly how many harakat are allowed and how much time can transpire between the sounds. That if you go too much, then you've, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's wrong. If you do too little, it's wrong. Something, there are things that have to have two harakat. There are things that have to have four harakat, right? What a dalin. There's a reason why you have to have, you can't say what a dalin. Right? In Tajweed, you have to have some elongation there. Right? So all of these, uh, this is tradition. These things were handed down. And the reason they're the same is because the source was the same. If you go back to the science of, this is a PhD thesis for somebody. If you go back to the, all of the uh, transmitters of the Quran, they go back to the same people. All of them, without exception. Only a handful of people transmitted the Qur'an. They all go back to the same ones. And so this is one of the miracles of Islam, is the tradition that's handed down, unbroken chains, Qur'an, hadith, fiqh. And then the tools, the adawat, even though they're different schools and they debate about things. You had the Kufan and the Basran schools in, in language. These are different schools. And they, and they will debate about uh, certain things. So all of this is part of the gifts of Islam. Now in this country, this is a country where tradition has been maintained. It's, this, it's, it's broken down in many places. People are very confused. But if you come to Turkey, there's much less confusion about what religion is. And the reason for that is that they protected the, this tradition. Their ulama did not allow these alien forces to come in and divide and conquer them. Because Allah says, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا We forget that it's a prohibition to become sectarian in the Qur'an. It's a prohibition. There's nahi عَنَ التَّفَرُّقُ Allah says, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا How did the Muslims do that? They had no synods. They had no magisterium. They had no councils. How did they do that? If you look at, uh, if you look at the Jews, the Jews have certain rabbinical councils that meet together and decide what's orthodoxy and what's not. If you look at the Christians, they had councils. They had the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chaldea. They had the Council of Alexandria. They had all these different councils. They come together and they meet and their bishops discuss what's going to be doctrine. And they hash it out. And then they come to certain agreements. And some of them disagree. They become heretics or heterodoxic. Right? And that's how the religion... The Muslims had none of that. There's no councils. There's no synods. There's no magisterium. How did they come to these agreements? This is a miracle of Islam. The providential hand that is taking care of this religion is so evident to anybody that's willing to openly look at it. How did they agree that there were... Uh, the Sunni community agree there are four basic madhab? How did they agree to that? Despite the fact we had dozens of madhabs. What happened to Laith? Really, where's Sufyan al thawri These were great fuqaha, but their ways died out. Where's Imam al-Awza'i? Where's Abu Dawud al-Zahiri? Why Malik, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, and, Abu Hani uh, and Ahmad? Why these four? The Inayah ilahiyah. These are the people that Allah, and it's not that the others were less than them, but for whatever hikmah, Allah chose these four to be the canonical schools of the Sunni tradition and the Ja'fari in the, in the Shia tradition. Th this is a miracle of Islam. To do this and to have them accept each other. The fact that they had four mihrab in the Kaaba is a miracle of Islam. That they weren't fighting each other. And, and if, the, if the Maliki was late for his Dhuhr uh, prayer, he would, uh, if, I'm sorry, if the Shafi'i was late for the Dhuhr prayer, he would pray with the Malikis. If the Shafi, the Hanafi, and the Hanbali were late for their uh, Asr prayer, they would pray with the Hanafis. If they were late for their Fajr prayer, they would pray with the Hanafis. And this, this wasn't because they were sectarian. They had one mihrab in Medina. People say, oh look, they got to a point, there was so much sectarianism, they had four madhab. No, it's pre-microphone. You know, Kaaba is a big place. They didn't, there, there, there was space for everybody. And that was the Sa'at al-Sudur. They had big breasts and they let everybody 
pray there. Each madhab was honored. The Hanafi obviously got the biggest one because the majority were Hanafi. And the Shafi'i at one point also very big. The Maliki small and then the Hanbali was very small because there were very few Hanbalis. But each was honored. And then in the Aqidah, you look at the Aqidah schools that were transmitted. The, the lots of debates. How did they agree on these things? Undeniably, there were periods of fitna and, and we went through uh, similar problems that other religions have had, but how did they arrive to these agreed upon things? This is not to deny that there are people, dissenters. There, there are, and they, if, they were, if they were of a caliber that the other ulama recognized their right to dissent, they would acknowledge it. But if they were heretics, they would call it what it was. Right? Heraseya is a Greek word, zandaka is used in Arabic, but harasaya in Greek means to choose for yourself. A heresy is where you pick and choose your religion. You don't accept what's transmitted, what's agreed upon. And, and so in the Aqidah, this, this is what they came. They, they came to, to, to the, the, the Ash'ari, the Maturidi. This, uh, the Ottoman Dawla was Maturidi. The Muhammad al-Fatih, he came into this city and conquered this city. The Prophet praised him. He said, Ni'm al-Amir. He said, Ni'm al-Jaysh wa Ni'm al-Amir. Ni'm al-Amir wa Amiruhum wa Ni'm al-Jaysh Jayshuhum. What a blessed Amir is their Amir and what a blessed army is their army. He was, by consensus, Hanafi, Maturidi, and Naqshbandi. So the Prophet was praising a Hanafi, Maturidi, Naqshbandi. And people say, Bid'a, Mubtada'. Astaghfirullah. Would the Prophet praise a Mubtada'? He would never praise a Mubtida. And yet we know he praised the conqueror of this city. He said, Ni'ma al-Amir. Ni'ma is the way the Arabs say the best. That's the best Amir, their Amir. And he would never praise worldly things, not like uh, he was a great general, which he was. No, he was praising his Iman. He was praising his Aqidah. He was praising his practice because he was Imamun Adil and Sab'atun Yadhilhum Allah Yom Allah Dhilla Illa Dhilluhum. Seven are, are given the shade of Allah on the day of judgment when there's no shade except Allah's shade. The first, the first, Imamun Adil, a just ruler. That's how high their maqam is. A high ruler. The dhikr of the, the Umara is Adil. That's their dhikr to practice justice. They don't have to do a lot of subha, even though he did, or do a lot of tilawa, even though he did. Qiyam they don't have to do any of that. If they're just, that's their dhikr. And they reach these high maqams. So that was who he praised. So this transmission, and then the, the third area, this is Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. How did they agree on the way of Imam al-Junaid? Imam al-Junaid is Imam by consensus. Imam al-Ta'ifatayn. No Sunni can yata'anu fi... Dr. Omar, you're here. He's a much greater scholar than I am. You know, I'm a suffer Allah, not even put my name under scholarship, but student of knowledge. But Dr. Omar, Imam al-Junaid, anybody disagree on him from the Sunni tradition? Do you know? Nobody. Ibn Taymiyyah praises him. Everybody praises him. He's Imam al-Ta'ifatayn. He was a great scholar. In, in, the, in, 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 in his madhab of Thawri, he was a great scholar, and he was a great uh, Sufi. And his tasawwuf spread because one of his students was the single most important narrator of Abu Dawood's uh, Musnad. So when, when Abu Dawood, the Sunan of Abu Dawood, when he went to Mecca and began transmitting the hadith, he taught Imam Junaid's uh, teaching there, and it spread all over the world. So in Morocco, the little children, they learn fi aqtara sha'ari wa fi qimarik wa fi tariqat al-junayd al-sadiq. And that's what they all learn. The, the aqid of Imam al-Ash'ari, the fiqh of Imam Malik, and the, the way of Imam al-Junayd. And this was Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And people say, you know, wh wh where is that? Where's tasawwuf in Islam? Where's the, the word? The, it's a technical term. It's a technical term, just like mantiq, kalam, fiqh. Fiqh is a technical term. People forget that. All the hadith in which the Prophet uses fiqh, he did not mean jurisprudence. He meant understanding. 
من يريد الله به خير يفقهه في الدين. He gives him an understanding of the religion. They use it later, and the books of fiqh always begin with that hadith because it's tafaulan, tabarrukan. But the original meaning of that, you look in the commentaries of a hadith, it meant yufahimuhu fi al-deen. And the sahaba knew that rubba hamri fiqhin laysa bi faqih. Sometimes somebody who walks around with a lot of information in his head isn't a faqih. They have all the outward, uh, what Imam al Ghazali calls al mutarassimun, the formalists. And he speaks very ill of them in the Ihya. Al Mutarassimun are the people of Rusum. They're trapped in the outward letter of the law and they don't know the spirit of the law. The, in Western, if you're studying Western tradition, the, what they call deontological ethics as opposed to teleological. In other words, a command theory type of ethics where everything's just rule, statute law, without understanding the, the, the teleological nature of, of law. What's the purpose? Why, why do we have these rules? Why, why were we given these things? Allah has reasons for everything. He gave us intellect. He made us rational creatures. We're not irrational creatures, even though we behave irrationally and we have an irrational component to us. But our nature is rational. Language is rational. Syntax is rational. The reason you can sit here and listen to me for however long you listen to me is because my words are put together in a way that has meaning. If it didn't, then you couldn't. If I was just table, sky, letter, I don't know. You know, if, it, if you just start talking like that, you walk out and say he's gone mad, right? because it would be irrational. So we are rational creatures and that's why Allah has spoken to us in, in a way that speaks to our intellects. فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِ abasar. Think, people of discernment, people of inner eye, people of understanding. فَاعْتَبِرُوا اِعْتِبَارُ It's a beautiful word. In Arabic it's related to the word Arabiya. You know, the abara. Ma'bara is a bridge. الدُّنْيَا مَعْبَرَةٌ فَتَعْبُرُوهَا وَلَا تَعْمَرُوهَا is one of the sayings of Isa. The, this world is a bridge. So cross over it. تَعْبُرُوهَا وَلَا تَعْمَرُوهَا Don't build on it. Don't think it's a permanent abode. Cross over it. The, the ibra is the lesson, but it comes from عُبُور which is language takes you from one place to another. That's why all language is, according to Ibn Jinni and other great Arab scholars, the linguist said that language is metaphorical by nature because we're speaking, to, we're using symbols, signs to signify something in order for me to take your mind from one place to another. So this is what i'tibar is. It's the ability to look at one thing and, and, and understand something else by it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tells you يُخْرِبُونُ بِيُوتُمْ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَيْدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that they destroy their houses with their own hands and with the hands of the believers Allah is saying فَاعْتَبِرُوا think about this isn't it amazing that Allah can take a people and he will make them destroy their own houses with their own hands the houses that they cherish that they built with those hands and yet he will cause them to destroy their own houses as a punishment to them. So Allah is saying, reflect on this. See the qudra of Allah. See the qudra of Allah in this. Because nobody would destroy his house. It's a mad thing to do. But people do it because Allah is punishing them. And so this is what Allah is saying. See the ibra, the lesson in it. And when the ibra is, is really penetrated, when it's really understood, you get the abra, which is tears. That's where the, the abra come from. Because it's, that's where meaning, when meaning penetrates the heart, the eyes often well up because it, they're overwhelmed. The, it, it fills the heart. And so that you can be filled with pain. You so much pain that you begin to overflow. And that's what tears are. They're the overflowing of the heart with something. You can have tears of joy. And that's when the heart is filled with joy, so it overflows. You can have meaning so powerful that you're so overwhelmed by it that you start to overflow. That's what tears are. They're overflowing inside your souls of meaning. Negative, positive, spiritual, material, but meaning. So this is a great gift that we have, you know, this tradition that we have. And there's people that want to reduce Islam to two-dimensional Islam. 
They want to reduce it, or one dimensional. They want to make it Islam without Iman and Ihsan. Or they want to make it Iman without Islam and Ihsan. Or they want to make it Ihsan without Iman and Islam. Or they want to make it Ihsan and, and Iman without Islam. You can't. It's a holistic, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a three-legged stool. You have to have all three for it to, to stand. Right? You cannot have one without the other. And this is why if Islam becomes divested of, of its spirituality, it becomes a shell. You have to have ihsan. And you have to have iman. And you can't have ihsan without iman and Islam, really, in reality. But there are people that will want to try to make it that. Islam's spiritual. Islam's here, brother. It's in the heart. No, Iman is in the heart. Islam is out, it's an outward thing, Sharia. It's, it's doing outward thing. Anybody can be a Munafiq, can be a Muslim, but he can't be a Mu'min, because Mu'min is an interior reality that reflects on the exterior. And then Ihsan is the depth dimension. It's, it's what gives you, the Iman gives you the height. Islam gives you the breadth, but Ihsan gives you the depth. And that's why what you witness here is Ihsan, because these were people of Ihsan. I mean, these were great people of Ihsan. And so it, it's, you know, I just, t to a few uh, statements in conclusion, what, one of the things, you, all of us are on a journey. This is the nature of life on earth. You came into the world, Allah, one of his names, everything is a tajalli of Allah. You know, all these names are manifesting in the world, everywhere. He's, he, he, you know, he, he's, he's outwardly manifest. His names are manifesting themselves before us. He's the muntaqim. He's the afu. He's the ghafoor. Inshallah, you're going to do the names this, in these coming days. But... He's qahirun fawqa ibadhi, you know, and his qahar is powerful. Like he, he is the overwhelming, the overpowering. And, and part of being overwhelmed is that you came into the world and Allah has put you here. And you're on a journey, whether you like it or not. Some people don't want to go on a journey, but they're forced to. Right? They're literally, they're forced to go on a journey. We're on a journey, whether you like it or not. And the journey has marahil. It has stations, there, there, and, and there's a road in front of you, and then there's diversions, do you see? But the problem with the diversions is that they won't get you to your goal, but you, you still end up going on that final journey. You're just not prepared. The diversions will always put you back, but without the provision you needed to really make the journey. So there's all these diversions, and shaitan is just sitting there on the road. He's got everything too. I mean, this is shaitan's heyday. He's never had more tools than he has today. It used to be ghiba, you needed another person with you. Now all you have to have is a cell phone or the internet. You can be anywhere and do ghiba. It used to be you had to have another person. <laughs> you know, now anywhere you go, you've got the tools for ghiba. Just right there. You have the tools for namima. Right? It uh, used to be, you know, that, I mean, now people, it's amazing the internet and the amount of time that people spend on these things, really. If you start, you, you know, you should clock in and just look and see what kind of time you spend on these things. Because people say, oh, I don't have any time. I never believe that. Because I know how much time I waste. You know, really, everybody, we are master time wasters, human beings. Even the most efficient people waste time. Because you, you can't, like a machine has an efficiency rate. You know, like a car, they say it's about 7%. Like 93% of the car's energy is just wasted in a combustion engine, very inefficient. The human body, it's working at about 33% at optimal work. It's dissipating a lot of caloric energy. This is, a huge, this is the nature of our creation. Allah has made a creation uh, like this, right? Ad kamalu lillah. Only Allah is perfect. He, even though His creation has its perfection, He put in the creation all these signs that by its very nature, it's, it's falling apart. So, also like that is your time, the amount of time you use. Everybody needs lahu. 
The Prophet ﷺ, he permitted it in certain times. The Sahaba used to have times of recreation. Recreation is an important part of life. But it's how much time you're wasting. Because you need some time, downtime. You have to have it. You have to sleep. You know, they're eating also. Uh, and then there has to be that time just where your mind is... You can't read all the time. You'll get sick. Really, you will. If you read all the time, you can't read all the time. And if you, do, if you know how to read, if you're doing serious reading, you can't read... Serious reading is more tiring than just uh, empty reading. Reading for tesliya, just for entertainment. Like thinking about what you're reading takes a lot of energy. So people waste time. It's a human condition. But Allah tells us, you know, wala tusrifu, you know, not to be people of israf. Wala tubedhir, tabdir. You know, don't be people of, of uh, tabdir. Inna, inna al-mubedhirin kana ikhwana shayateen. Because they're the mubedhirin, the consumers, are brethren of the shayateen, right? People that you bedhiru, they waste, just consume things. Ahlaktu mal al lubada, and the man boasts, I, I have spent vast amounts of wealth. Ahlaktu, like I destroyed it, consumed it. Right? One of the old English words for the devil is the consumer, because he consumes souls. And that's what this modern world is doing with people, is just consuming them. They're, they're wasted away, really. If you look out there, especially uh, if, where people don't have ibadah anymore, you see the, va the vacuity of the faces, you can see the emptiness, you can see the pain, there's a lot of suffering. And you shouldn't look at these people with contempt. You, you know, Muslims have traditionally looked with compassion, it's arrogance to have this view of superiority because, oh, they don't worship or they don't know. Why ha who, you should have told them. Aqba bin Nafi' when he arrived to the ocean of the Atlantic he, they say he had his horse ride into the ocean as the waves were hitting his horse he said to Allah, oh Allah if I knew there were people on the other side of this ocean I would build ships to take your religion to them and that was the himma of the early Muslims and that was the himma of these people also you know to take Islam and the great people of Tasawwuf who spread Islam in India and went into the little villages with the Hindus where they're worshipping idols and things like that and they taught them uh, about Islam. So this, this is, uh, you know, we're in a time where the tools of shay the shayateen are immense. You just have so many tools. And so this is a really, uh, all of us, and I include myself, wallahi, all of us are blessed to have this, this is called leisure time. This time that we have, leisure, in the traditional sense of the word. Joseph Pieper, a great German philosopher, wrote a book called Leisure. And, and what he argues is that leisure is the foundation of civilization, the time to think. It is the time to cultivate the mind and the spirit. That is what leisure is. Leisure comes from a, a, a Latin word which means license. It's, it's a permission. It's the time where you're permitted to do the things you were created to do fully, right? It's a rukhsa. And so you, you have a time now, this time that you have here, is a, it's a great time of immense benefit, inshallah. So my advice to myself and to all of you is utilize this time. This is precious time. It's free time. You're, you're people of leisure right now. You look, we have people serving us. You look at those people. They're serving us. There's people serving our food. There's people cleaning our rooms. There's people driving us to and from, right? Look with, with the eye of love to those people because without them, we couldn't do what we're doing. We would be busy doing those things. And so what an honor to be amongst people that Allah allows this time this time to be afforded to us, to cultivate our minds and our spirits, to try to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a gift. I mean, just, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamdan yuafi ni'amuhu yukafi mazida. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamdan yuafi ni'amuhu yukafi mazida. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamdan yuafi ni'amuhu yukafi mazida. 
The Prophet said, if you say that three times in the morning and the evening, then if you say it sincerely from your heart, it's enough of gratitude to Allah. But really, be in a state of gratitude to Allah because this, this is just such a blessing to be afforded this leisure time to cultivate our, our spirits and our minds, especially before Ramadan, you know, because this is going to be an excellent preparation. Inshallah, this will be the best Ramadan that we have. May Allah give us a, a beautiful Ramadan. And a beautiful uh, Sha'ban is a great, we're going to be here. You know, a, a nice thing also about the Sunni country, this uh, Sunni country is they, they really honor the traditional days. Like the Nuf Sha'ban is a big night, you know. It's a big night. I'll tell you, there's a khilaf about it, which is fine. It's a khilaf. Imam Malik did not practice Sha'ban, Nus Sha'ban. Imam Malik himself, he didn't. The hadiths were from the people of Sham. Al Awza'i considered it a big night. The Sham ulama of the Tabi'een all elevated Nus Sha'ban. But it spread throughout the world, and the Malikis ended up celebrating it. So even though Imam Malik, it's fine. If people don't want to celebrate, that's fine. But Ibn Rushd gave a great qaida. Ibn Rushd said, if you ever have an ikhtilaf about the rahmah of Allah, always err on the side of rahmah. <laughs> you know, if there's a valid ikhtilaf, does the Quran get to dead people or doesn't it? He just said, look, just consider it that it gets there because it's rahmah. And wherever there's more rahmah, then there's more Islam. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, uh, he said that Al Islam kulluha rahma, fa idha intaqarat min al rahmati ila diddiha, laysa min al Islam. Islam is all mercy. So if it goes from mercy to its opposite, it's not from Islam. He said, Al Islam wa hikma kulluha hikma, fa idha intaqarat min al hikmati ila diddiha, fa laysa min al Islam. Islam is all wisdom. So if it goes from Wisdom to its opposite, it's not from Islam. He said, Al Islamu Adrun, Kulluhu Adrun. Faidan taqara min al Adri il al Jawr, Laysa min al Islam. He said that Islam is justice, it's all justice. So if it goes from justice to, uh, to uh, its opposite, then it's not from Islam. So may Allah, inshallah, give you all the, the blessing of this time. You know, may, may He give you the ability to make use of it. Um, we, we really owe also a lot to the, the volunteers. There's a group of volunteers. Please treat them all with respect. You know, there's always going to be things that arise. That, you know, people will, can have genuine problems. And then you have whiners and complainers. And I'm not saying any of you are from those people. I don't think there's any whiners and complainers here, inshallah. But there are people that just, their nature is they just like to whine and complain. You know people like that. I mean, all of you have had those experiences. And so they will just find little anything to whine or complain about. The food's not good enough, shame on you. You know, ma'aba ta'aman qat, ya Rasulullah. The Prophet never uh, criticized food. We have so much blessing. The food is, will be excellent food. So, you know, uh, if you have a valid complaint or something, then take it to one of the people with adab. That's fine. But don't uh, complain and uh, just to be a complainer. So, you know, nobody likes complainers, even other complainers. <laughs> they, they don't because they want to be complaining and, they, and you're taking up all their time. Right? They want to wait till you stop complaining so they can start complaining. So... Uh, you know, inshallah, uh, Aisha Subhani, mashallah, may Allah bless her. She, you know, she's mother and a physician, and she did uh, so much work to really make this happen. And also, uh, Dr. Rajab Sh uh, Shintirk, he's the head of this incredible uh, revival here of traditional Islamic studies, really doing a beautiful job. And I would say he asked me yesterday, he wants master's and PhD candidates. So if anybody is looking to do a master's or a PhD, then you can apply here. They have a one-year program to learn Turkish. They, they put you in a, a mahad. It's five hours a day. And you learn uh, university-level Turkish in a year. And then you can do the master's and PhD. It's an it's a accredited program. We're going to have, inshallah, Zaytuna 
during this time, we talked about it last year, we're gonna have a letter of understanding, memorandum of understanding between the two institutions. So people that graduate from Zaytuna can come here automatically uh, if they get a degree from Zaytuna to do their master's PhD here. So alhamdulillah, you know, the, and then yesterday we had uh, Dr. Bakar, who's a beautiful man. He's a, he was a professor of philosophy. He's very close. He's one of the top advisors to the president. And he, he's on the board here because the president, uh, President Erdogan has been very heavily involved in this institution here which is part of the Alliance of Civilizations. So uh, he visited us last year, and so maybe we'll get a visit, but they, just for security reasons and other things, they don't, uh, they don't really tell us what's gonna happen. So, but um, he's a very, very great man, inshallah. May Allah protect him. And um, is there any, uh, maybe just four question, uh, and then, does anybody have any question they want to ask? Go ahead, Fadla. What's that? Uh, you mentioned, uh, you quoted Ibn Rushd. Yeah. And you said if there's, if there's an ikhtilaf, if yeah, you can if just... If there's an ikhtilaf, a valid ikhtilaf amongst the ulama about something that involves the rahmah of Allah, like he used it as the example of the qira'a. You know, t some of the ulama say you can recite for the dead and give it as charity to them. And some say you can't. Because there's a hadith, إِذَا مَاتِ بْنُ آدَمَ قَطَعْ مِنْ عَمْرِ إِلَّا مِنْ And some of them apply that hadith to the idea of qira'a. So some say you can do a khatam of Qur'an and give the thawab to a dead person. And, and that's a khilaf. The majority of ulama say that it's, you can and that it does benefit the dead. Um, but Ibn Rushd said this is a khilaf about the rahmah of Allah. And so when there's a khilaf about the rahmah, he said, it's better to assume the, the, the rahmah side of it. <laughs> because ma qadrullah haqqa qadri, you know, they don't really give Allah his true estimate. Rahmati wa So that was the point. So in a lot of these things, you know, there's a khilaf about many things in Islam. They're not, for, you know, the majority of ulama permit the mawlid, uh, and some don't. There are some valid ulama that just, you know, they, they, they didn't like it. So, but they didn't say not to celebrate. You have to celebrate the mawlid. You, if you're not happy that he was born, you're a kafir. So you have to celebrate, because mawlid me, means makan and zaman. You know, it's ism makan and zaman. You have to be happy. Ihtifal bil mawlid. You have to have ihtifal in your heart that the Prophet was born. And you should love the place he was born, which is Mecca. You have to. So, وَنَحْتَفِرُ بِمَكَّةَ بِمَوْلِدِهِ We have to. So, but the idea of specifying a day, like the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, and having formal things as a thing. Some of the ulama said the early people didn't do it. Let's not do it. But the vast majority historically said it was, and they had their proofs, the Mawlid of Isa is in the Quran. Surat Maryam is clearly celebrating his birth. And, and uh, when the man asked the Prophet if I could fast on uh, Mondays, he said, Fihi wuridtu. In other words, it's a good day. I was born on that day, so it's a good day. That's in Sahih Muslim. So it's saying it's an auspicious day. Just because he, he was born in that day, it's an auspicious day. And, and so he was acknowledging in the question of that man that one of the blessings of Monday is that was the day he was born. And so, you know, the ulama have their proofs on both sides, but it's a, again, it's a khilaf that shouldn't be an issue amongst Muslims. And this is part of the problem of modern Islam, well, and pre-modern as well, but part of just provincial Islam, let's call it provincial Islam. Part of the problem with provincial Islam is people want to impose their view about something on everybody. And if it's a matter of ishtihad, you can't do that. It's, you know, المختلف فيه لا ينكر. Something that has اختلاف is not condemned by sharia. That's a qaida fiqhiyya, it's a universal principle in Islam. المختلف فيه لا ينكر. 
Yunkar al Mujma alayh. Now the ulama do have caveats about that qaida. If you're living in a country where the majority is following one school, like Morocco, where traditionally it was a Maliki country, and people started doing things that were against the Urf, then they said, you know, in those type of situations, you could uh, tell them not to do it. But generally, especially in our time now, we have to go for the, the most compassionate uh, view. Because one of the maqasid of Islam the, you know, the six universals, or five, however you want to look at the nasab and the irb. But the six universals of Islam, the first one is protection of the deen. That's the first one, is to protect the deen. 